Fantastic. Uh, welcome to the Tourist Supply Workshop. It's a little bit different than our monthly meetings. Uh, if this is your first time with us, uh, we appreciate you coming out. We meet, uh, our monthly meetings, we meet at the, the last Wednesday of every month uh, in that room over there. Uh, and today it's a little bit uh, different. Um, and usually we have a couple field trips every month, especially during the, especially during the warmer months. And uh, since we don't really go out on that many field trips during the colder months, we try to have something. And uh, we're really uh, lucky to have uh, uh, Tyler and Sarah from uh, Tour Supply to come in. Uh, just a couple of quick things before I do my introductions. Megan uh, is in the back and Natalie, and they are doing new memberships. Hi. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Fantastic. Um, <laughs> she's doing uh, their new memberships, and it's an annual membership uh, for the Herb Society, and they can tell you more, or you can find me after the meeting. They're also doing raffle tickets. All of our items uh, are on the table. The only thing that's not on there is a bag of rats. I forgot at my mom's house, like a couple blocks away, she's not going to be very happy. <laughs> she's going to say I did it on purpose for some reason. I can just party. So, um, and so we'll take a break as soon as uh, Tyler is done presenting to, for if anyone else wants raffle tickets for that. And then we'll go through the raffle and uh, send those off. Uh, we also have Herb Society shirts, you can uh, see them. These go for $20. There's two different designs in different colors. You can see Thomas, uh, Dr. Conley has, oh, there she goes. She's a, she's a, and then you got the, uh, oh. the paint splatter ones. So we have, we have a couple different designs that we uh, send out. So we should go and get those after or during the rock portion. Um, Thomas, am I forgetting anything? I don't think so. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, fantastic. Uh, usually, uh, I do some sort of magical trick. Uh, the t-shirts, just by the way, I got a couple of emails. They're not magical in any way. Um, but uh, if you were at our last meeting, you'd get that joke. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to introduce Tyler. Uh, Tyler, interesting, we met uh, at Repticon. That was our first show. Uh, and a lot of people uh, uh, met Tortoise Supply. And uh, we really wanted Tyler to come down during a normal monthly meeting. Uh, but you know, they work, have a few kids, and this kind of really worked out to have a tourist supply workshop. Uh, so Tyler kind of grew up uh, chasing lizards in the desert, and uh, then he started breeding and keeping uh, uh, Jackson Vale and uh, Panther Chameleons, and they uh, slowly expanded in 2003 and 2004. 2004. Uh, he produced a surprising amount of chameleons uh, every month in different species, and uh, almost out of luck, he, uh, he always says that he was actually pretty good at it uh, with the exotic and fragile creatures. Uh, he was heavily involved in the chameleon market in late 2007 uh, when a few factors forced him to re redirect his reptile addiction. Uh, more than anything, he uh, was working many hours in his normal job. He was a single dad and uh, didn't have uh, time to care for the 2,000 plus chameleons at any time. No, it's a lot. Uh, I can't even imagine having 2,000 or 200 of, of, a, of an animal, um, especially with all the cage clean, the cricket care, and everything else that comes with it. And he was stressed for time uh, and started to feel that some chameleon burnout. So after getting married in early, uh, early 2008, he managed to drag his wife, Sarah, uh, into the business with him and put all the efforts into the tortoises and weaned themselves out of the chameleons that he kept for so many years. Um, he always had many of the tortoises running around, just never put his entire focus on them until that point. Uh, he says that it's been a refreshing start to something new and for the market. Um, so I can keep on going and tell you because I know uh, Tyler wants to share a little bit about, just a little bit about him. Sarah and him were both born and raised in Northwest Las Vegas and still live there. Uh, they actually knew each other since they were little kids and didn't actually date until a few years after college. That sounds like a fairy tale. <laughs> Um, they both come from very large families and spend much of their free time both in Vegas and parts of Utah. Uh, Sarah is a hairdresser part-time, tortoise caretaker part-time, and she handles almost all the phone calls. Um, but we were actually talking at dinner and she would appreciate calling after the time. Not at 4.15 in the morning. Not at 4.15 yeah, in the morning. Uh, <laughs> uh, Full-time mom uh, with a son and a two-year-old Mac who helps uh, dad each afternoon with the tortoise work. Uh, it's, uh, who, who is that? That's well, we have, okay, we have a nine-year-old. Nine-year-old. We have two and a half-year-olds. Two and a half-year-olds. We have a one-year-old. One-year-old. And we're due in February. Due in February. Man, you're crazy. Mm -hmm. It's almost as many tortoises. So, without further ado, I'm going to introduce Tyler and Sarah.
Thank you, and I'm glad to be here. It's been a long day, but we made it. Um, I brought a lot of variety. We're going to talk about a lot of uh, different topics, so we'll maybe take a few breaks after the major topics if you have questions specific to a topic, and then at the end, if we have just general, that's fine too. Um, we kind of threw together a slideshow here. These are some of our uh, line of stoccatos we had hatched last year, which was a complete surprise to us, but it was nice. It was interesting again. We haven't been able to do it again yet, but we're trying. Um, you want to flip the slide? This is kind of where we're going to start, choosing your tortoise. So if you have in your mind that you want to get one, there's a lot of things you can consider. These are kind of the major points. You know, the climate, obviously, a lot of tortoises need to be outside eventually. And um, if you're in sh Chicago or something like that, it's just hard to do. And there's some that you, that you can make work based on like the size. Um, the swallow ones that can be indoors part of the year or, or not. Um, and then the expense, you know, the obviously range, you know, on the low end, you know, 80 bucks, 100 bucks for a tortoise, for a baby. And they go all the way up to into the thousands. So a lot of things um, contribute to that. And then Captain Red versus an imported tortoise also. Uh, if you want to flip through. So there's two major, we kind of classify, and there's a lot of debate on this, but most tortoises will fit into one of these two categories. You have the grassland species that are more like the African tortoises, um, some of the European tortoises that handle the heat. Some of them have really cold winters and some don't. Um, and then there's the forest tortoise, which generally are like the Asian species or like the South American species, where they don't really have a winter. They'll kind of be warm you know, in the summer, and then the winters cool down a little bit, but not enough that they would need to hibernate <coughs> or that they can handle the cold. Um, do you want to put this slide? This is the grasslands. These are kind of the, the bullet points on them. They generally are warm in the summer. Uh, the diet consists of high fiber, low protein items. So they're eating a lot of grasses. A lot of the Africans, um, like this is a leopard tortoise. And these, you know, their natural diet is probably 90% grass. So they'll just eat, you know, have very little nutrition, but they eat enough of it that it that it works. And um, the stars are kind of the same thing. These are from India, from Sri Lanka. They're also very heavy in the grass diet. <clears throat> and then some of them will hibernate based on the region, where that's a lot of the European types, like a Greek. You know, Greeks come from a lot of different areas. Some of them will hibernate. Some, there's some debate whether they do or not. Uh, in Las Vegas, we let them all hibernate, so they'll all go down for the winter. Some of them, you know, if it gets 55, 60 degrees in the middle of the winter, they'll come out for the day, kind of say hi, and then disappear again. <coughs> uh, the Russians are the same way, uh, the Hermans. So there's a lot of variety in the, in the warmer climate, kind of based on where they come from. <coughs> they also, most of them get very little water naturally, or they'll have really seasonal water. So they'll have like a, a monsoon season, and then they'll dry out part of the year. Um, as adults, they don't need a whole lot of water. Um, some of them we give, usually like in the summers, we'll give them water bowls outside so that they can drink if they want to. But a lot of people don't, and a lot of people don't think they need it. We'll, a lot of people just blow the pens twice a month. They'll run around, drink it up, and make them hold water for, for the rest of the, of the time. <laughs> These are some examples of some of our lizard types. The top left is a bunch of free tortoises. Those are from Jordan, naturally. Those are that, that type. There's, we have about five different kinds of breeds. But those are the Jordanians. Uh, the top right is some of our Russians. Bottom left is a Solkata. Those are the big African. I didn't bring one here, but they get big. And the, our big males are about 150 pounds. I don't know, if you were at Red Catan at the Reno show, we had a big male there that a lot of people saw. Uh, in the bottom right, that's actually a nest of sulcatas that hatch right out of the ground. So they lay the eggs in, they usually lay in the spring. Those hatch, I think it was September, that they were hatching out of the yard. And there was about a month where we could go out just about every day and collect babies out of the various pens. It's, it's usually like August and September. We have a heavy rainfall that softens up all the dirt and babies just come up out of everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Easter. It's like Easter. <laughs> we send the kids with a five-gallon bucket. 
These are the forest species. Um, these, again, like the, a lot of the Asian ones that just don't have a big difference in weather. Um, the main ones that you would see are like the cherry heads or the, this is a cherry head, they're from Brazil. Uh, there's also red foots, which are a little bit, pretty much just like this, but they get a little bit bigger. And they're from all over South America, as well as the yellow foots. This is a female cherry head. And then this is a Burmese brown mountain tortoise from Asia. And these get, these are actually very large tortoises as adults. They'll get a little bit bigger than leopards, almost as big as Socatas in some cases. The browns are a little smaller. There's also a black form that gets a little bit bigger. Super friendly tortoises. But they, just about all of them have a lot of, of water requirement because they live in areas that are almost rain, you know, some of them are rainforests to just heavy forests and they get a lot of rain there. Uh, a lot of humidity also. So when we're raising them, like these ones that are outside, we have in areas with cypress mulch on the ground, and the sprinklers in the summer will go off four or five times a day, just for a few minutes at a time, because it just wants to, you want to, you want to get it wet, and the humidity will come up through the rest of the day, and when it dries out, the sprinklers kick on again. Um, they are a little tricky in the desert, but they're doable, and we have shade cover over all those species. But we'll have up above like 80% shade cloth in the summer. Um, they pretty much don't hibernate at all because they're from those moderate fine areas. Um, and then the diet, they're eating a lot more, like the grasslands don't really have fruit in their natural habitats at all, but these do. They'll be eating you know, mangoes and things that fall down from trees. They'll also eat a lot more, um, kind of sounds nasty, but if they find like a dead animal, a lot of times they'll take a few bites or they'll chew on bones. They'll eat worms, you know, slugs that they come across them. It's not really a major part of the diet. We don't really offer up uh, much meat. We give them, like the Missouri tortoise diet that has a good protein amount in it, but we don't really give them, they don't really need to be fed like a meat-based diet at all. Next slide. These are some examples that top left. It's a baby red foot, a lot like these ones we have here. This is about uh, two or three months old. They hatch just a little bit smaller than this, but not much. They don't grow a whole lot for two months. Um, I think that's a bell pepper that it's eating there. <coughs> the top right is the baby elongated, which eventually turn into bees, which are also an Asian species. Really white heads. You'll see it here. You know, solid white heads, solid black eyes. It's kind of a cool contrast. And this is about as big as it'll get. Um, what species was that? Elongated. Thank you. The bottom left is a yellow foot. Those are some of the red foots that are from parts of South America. And then that bottom right one is a little bit black, which is, it's about what this is. This is a brown, but they're real similar. Same size of that one, a little bit smaller. Next slide. Okay, the size and strain. This is a, probably, should be the most important thing that someone considers. Because a lot of people that live in climates that are not suitable will buy tortoises that get large. And it's hard to house them outdoors. You know, it's one thing when it's four inches you have to bring them through the winter on a little tabletop cage. But when they're 100 pounds, even if you can bring them in, they're just not going to be happy. You know, even in a garage in a six foot pen or something, they just spend the whole winter kind of miserable trying to get out. They eat a lot, and they will the bathroom a lot, and they can smell you really quick if they're inside. So, <coughs> There's a lot of things you can do. A lot of species stay small. So it's just good to make the right choice when you're, when you're picking for size. Um, a lot of waters we keep outside in the winter. Actually, pretty much all of our adults stay out in the winter. And the ones that don't hibernate, we probably half of our numbers will hibernate in the winter. So it, it really reduces our workload. But a lot of like these leopards will not. Red foot cherry as well. So these we build. Big boxes. Um, I built plywood boxes, basically like a doghouse. And inside of them, we'll put little heat lights with like a red bulb that doesn't really affect them sleeping. Or we'll put ceramic heaters or heat pads. There's a lot of ways you can do it. But we don't get super cold, but last winter we got down to 18 degrees, which is about as cold as, as I've ever remember it being there. Um, but then we're down to, you know, as long as you're getting kind of warm during the day, and maybe in the 50s, most of them will come out and do a lap or two in the day. Warm up a little bit inside and then go back to the boxes. Given the expense, 
Um, a lot of things impact the cost of the tortoises. Um, a lot of it is just a supply and demand. Um, the really attractive tortoises are obviously more desirable, so they end up having a higher price because more people are after them. Um, <clears throat> another, another major thing, like with the stars especially, they're not hard to keep, but they only lay two eggs at a time. So when something's only laying two eggs, you know, maybe twice a year, and there's really not a whole lot of them in the first place, it makes them pretty hard to come by. So that's uh, one thing. Even like the Russians are kind of that way too. They just don't lay a lot of eggs. They don't have great hatch rates, which is a lot of problem with the stars. They get a lot of eggs and maybe half of them will hatch. <coughs> the demand we kind of always also talked about. The um, importation numbers, that's something that really changes the numbers because something like a Russian tortoise that are very common, but they're very infrequently bred in captivity because they import these, you know, I don't know, thousands per year. And um, when they're imported like that, they're usually pretty cheap. And a lot of people end up with them, but they're not really one that's really easy to breed. So to get a captive bred baby is still pretty tricky. And there's a lot available, but nowhere near what there should be, given the amount of adults that are already in the country. And then the amount of information. This is kind of like a referral. Uh, I refer to it like a referral. Uh, that a lot of species get. If you get on, say, like a forum or something, and you say, what kind of tortoise should I get? A lot of people have two or three species in their head, and a lot of them send those to you as ideas. And that really affects what's selling, because that's what, there's a lot of species that, like the elongates, I think they're really underrated. And that's just because nobody ever tells anyone to go buy them. But they're really cool tortoises. To me, they're every bit as cool as a redfoot. But you'll see a red, a red foot being referred to people a lot more often just because there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of people that have them that like them. So that also contributes to the value of the prices of them. Next slide. There are a few pictures. That left side is some radiated tortoises. Uh, the top right is a couple of baby aldabras. And the bottom right are the albinos and All those are pretty rare, pretty expensive. Um, yeah, the Sokas and the Yanabin are selling for 2500 piece for the babies and for the Alhamas. <coughs> Next slide. This is the pros and cons kind of of the wild cod versus captive bread. Um, wild cod usually are low cost. Usually they have some good size to them. They're not right out of the egg. You know, having a baby, it's not going to breed. You know, a lot of them have to be six or eight or ten years old before they can even breed. So when you start with one that's already you know, four inch size, which is minimum for the being imported, they are a lot closer to being readable at that point. So a lot of people like that on it gives them a little bit of start. Um, the cons, they almost always have internal parasites. I don't know that I've seen one come in for a while that didn't, that I can think of. Um, when we are getting, if we get a group of them, the first thing we do is start deworming them. And it takes it takes us about a month to get them clean. Um, a lot of people buy them and they think they're healthier. They'll, a lot of people just suggest a quarantine, which doesn't necessarily get rid of the parasites. They stick them in the pen and they say if they're alive in three months, they're good to go. But they can hold parasites for years. And when they're in the pen, they just shed the parasites in the pen and they can reinfect themselves. So it doesn't really get rid of them. You have to actually go through the process of deworming them. And depending on what the bug is that they have, it can be tricky or it can be pretty simple. Um, they also sometimes can have sicknesses that are a lot more serious than parasites that can't be gotten rid of. And if you were to introduce one of those tortoises into an established collection, it can pretty easily wipe out your collection. And that happens quite a bit. Somebody will have one, like I said, they'll put it in quarantine, they'll stick it aside for six months, and if it's alive in six months, they assume that it's healthy, and they put it in the group, and a year later everything's dead. And that happens a lot. And that's why it's important to go through it and know what you have, especially when you have a group that's long term, you want to just leave it alone. You don't want to add or take from it as much as possible. After bread is the alternative. Um, you can assume that they're parasite free. It's, it's pretty rare for a baby to have a parasite unless it's just kept in terrible conditions or unless it's kept in, a, in an enclosure that had wild cats in it recently. Um, generally, babies are kept indoors anyway, so it's pretty, uh, pretty unusual for them to pick up a parasite unless. If, if, 
parasites don't really just come out of the air. They have to come from an outside source. And unless there's another source being housed with it or in a cage that it was in, it's pretty hard for these to show up. So the younger one is more likely to be parasite food. Um, babies are <coughs> generally more fragile, which kind of sounds weird, but even a four inch one with parasites can be a pretty hardy tortoise. Um, the first thing you do is if you do warm them, they usually do pretty well after that. If you don't, they might just kind of linger, kind of get by, you know, sometimes for years before it really matters. But um, the babies <coughs> can be fragile because they're a little less tolerant to mistakes that you might make or, you know, when the, the imported ones have the growth, the, the critical growth stages are behind them. So they can kind of get by with, you know, a, a, a less than perfect diet or they can get by with less than the lighting or temperature, but the babies really need to be more spot on than the adults do. Um, if you buy a baby, you would know the age, you know where it came from, generally, especially if you're buying straight from like a breeder, you know um, particularly like the age or the, you can maybe compare the pictures of the, of the parents if they know who the parents are. <coughs> but also more right than the human hands, so they, they don't go into the fright mode for a while. A lot of times the important ones will be real shy for a year or two and they'll start coming around. The babies are pretty much from day one. They've seen people, they know what's going on. They're not real freaked out about that. Next slide. In an indoor house, you kind of set up a generic one here. You can all check out afterwards if you want. Um, the size should be pretty relative to the tortoise. Um, this tub here, I would say it's probably about the minimum for just about any baby tortoise. It could be used for just about any species. And then as they grow, they need the enclosure to grow proportionally. Um, if you had some, you know, obviously these are not appropriate sizes for any of these, but um, the bigger ones, even the smaller species as adults are gonna need, you know, 10, 10 by 10, 10 by five feet. So it's quite a bit of space. And if they're indoors, a lot of people bring them just for the winters, put them in like a four by two enclosure. And they just, you know, it doesn't really hurt them, but they're just kind of miserable for the, the time that they're in there. It's hard to do long term and have success with them if they're in a less than big, big enough cage. cage. Uh, the substrates, there's lots of different things you can use. There's a few we really like. Cypress is one of them. That's what these are. These are all cypress mulch. Uh, we get it from Florida. We buy it by the truck just because it's hard to find on the West Coast. We use it um, outdoors for all of our forest species. And if they're indoors, we use it for just about everything that's bigger than about four inches. Um, some babies we house on it, but more desert confinement species. I like it because it holds moisture well. You can add water to it, you can dry it out. It's not really dusty, it's not really hard wood, so it doesn't, if they ingest a little bit of it, it doesn't clog them up like a lot of species will. Um, another thing I really like is this coconut. Uh, we get the kind of called plantation soil. It's a type of uh, coconut that they shred and use as a substrate. It's really soft, so it's pretty digestible. You still should make an effort not to have them eating it if you can. You don't want to put like a wet piece of lettuce on it because they're going to eat a lot of it. But you want to use a little bowl or even like a paper plate just so they're not giving you the food as much as possible. We'll usually mix a handful of cypress in just to break it up, just to add some texture to it. Um, what I don't recommend would be any of the sands. The sand tends to be problems indoors. Um, if they're outdoors, it's kind of a misinterpretation people have because when a tortoise in, in the wild lives on dirt, obviously, but they're not eating their food right off of the dirt. They're eating their food <coughs> off of a leaf that's four inches off the ground. Well, and the dirt is, you know, it's been raked on, it's been packed down, it's nice and hard and flat. And it's not, it's not the, uh, not going to really stick to any of the food that they're because the food's not right off the ground. But in captivity, a lot of people get the sand that's like right off the beach and they think that's a natural substrate, and it's just not. And the sand, you, you rarely see a tortoise in the wild walking on sand that soft, and certainly not eating off of sand that soft. So when it's in a cage, it ends up getting a lot better, it ends up building up in their stomach, and a lot of time it can clog them up and kill them. A lot of time, once you realize there's a problem, it's too late to really even fix. Um, a lot of the wood substrates, there's a, um, like the bark, just about all of that. I've seen quite a bit of cases where it has caused problems. 
So we pretty much, I mean, indoors, we pretty much get the cypress and the coconut more than just about anything else. Um, temperatures, that's something that's pretty species specific. It depends what you have. But generally, they need the, we, we give all of our tortoises UV light, which is what this is. It's a UVB source, so it'll give them, it'll help them with like a calcium processing that they would get from the sun. They're not cheap bulbs, so a lot of people skimp on that. But that's, it, it causes problems after a couple months without it. They usually get real soft, sometimes even within a month. They get really soft. They can't absorb the calcium right. The shells don't go right, especially if they, they need that to be right so that they can get the calcium they need out of their foods. And we also give the heat light. Um, the wattage is going to depend on the species and the distance off the substrate. Um, if you have UV light, this can just be a cheap light bulb. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. It's just a heat source. The bright light kind of keeps them awake, keeps them alert, and keeps them active. But as long as you have the separate strip light, you don't need this to be anything fancy. And that's kind of what we do on our forest species if they're indoors. On the more desert species, we usually use the mercury vapor bulbs that are, um, they do the UVA, UVB heat light, all in one. They're usually pretty hot. They start out at about 100 watts. So you want to use a little bit, you know, maybe a little bit bigger enclosure. This would be pretty small for the UV bowl, but if you had something a little bit bigger, and just put the, the heat light kind of in the corner so you can get under it if you want to and then cool off if you want to. <coughs> you and I, it's something that a lot of people don't know about, don't do right, but what helps these things grow smoothly is a big kind of wives' tale about the pyramid, where you'll see, like on this one, you can see how the shell is raised up in these bumps. That's because it was raised with the humidity being too low. And it sounds kind of funny because a lot of people picture a desert tortoise out in the middle of the desert with no humidity at all. But in the wild, the first couple of years, they're underground 90% of the time, probably. They're in burrows where it's really humid and it's really warm. So when they're underground like that, in the wild, you won't see a pyramid like this, not nearly as often. The majority of the time, they look a lot more like this, where they're smooth or just maybe a little bit above but generally smooth, and that's because in the wild they're underground, they're humid. Even in the dry climates, they're humid a lot of the time. These are indoors. <clears throat> so in the cages, a lot of times, some of these forest ones, we just keep the whole area really humid. If, if it's 90% humidity anyway, you don't need a humid hide. But like the desert species, the leopards, silkatas, the Greeks, we'll have a little hide box, just with a little door in it, and we'll keep that area warm and, and moist. We'll put a heat pad. Um, yeah, like these. These are just a little cheap. You know, they're like 10 bucks or something. But they are just a little bit of a heat pad. They're only like 4 watts. So you can stick it underneath and then put the hide right on top. And it'll keep that area warm and humid. And after a year, you'll see the significant difference in the, the smoothness of the tortoises versus one. You could raise two side by side and be a nine day contrast in the curve. Um, for the water source and soakings, a lot of people will put water bowls in the cage with them. Um, what we do alternatively on the babies is take them out of the cage and we'll soak them in shallow water, just up to the, right there where the chin is. And if you have them sitting in the pan, you just want the water, you don't want it to go to their nose, but just about to the chin. And they'll drink out of that. And we'll, we do that with all of our tortoises about three to four times a week. Um, if you can have a water bowl in the cage, but most of the time it's just a mess within a half a day. And it's a lot of work to keep it clean. It's probably safer not to have dirty water in there anyway. So we just take them out and do it outside. We take them out and soak them. They usually go to the bathroom outside the cage. It helps keep the cage clean and flush the water real quick and just get rid of it. Um, okay, next. How long do you soak this? Uh, about 10 to 15 minutes. And the water
So it's kind of like this, but a little different. A different subspecies of this. The top right is some major inputs that are soaking in water. You can see one of the legs drinking. They dip their heads down like that. So very good. Next. Okay, outdoor housing. This, I think, is the ideal way to do it if you can, particularly in the summer. Um, size is, again, you want to make it as, as much as you can, uh, especially if the choice has any size to it. You don't want it to be too small. <coughs> they do spend a lot of time wandering around. Um, the substrate, uh, most of the time we just use dirt. Uh, depending on the species, we'll put grass in them. We'll plant a lot of different plants. We'll put, we use a lot of African sumac trees and mesquite trees for shade. Um, but generally it's just dirt. As long as it's clean, dirt hasn't had any chemicals or junk sprayed into it. It's not really a big deal what kind of dirt it is. The plants, um, you want to do stuff that's not real high maintenance. You also want to check that they're safe. If you just you can just Google like a safe plants list, it's pretty easy to find uh, lists of plants that are safe from toxic to, to humans or animals. And uh, so a lot of them are edible. You can do the same with the searches on tortoises. A lot of ones we use, uh, like hibiscus, we use a lot of honeysuckle. <coughs> and they'll munch on those leaves if they can reach them. A lot of times, because the plants grow, they'll, the leaves will fall, the flowers will fall, and they'll leave that up. They like roses and grapes and all sorts of leaves like that. Mulberry does really well. The high box, I think we have a photo on the next slide, but we will come to that in a minute. We just, it's, like I said, we build the big wood boxes for the door. You don't want the door any bigger than it has to be because that just lets cold air in. <coughs> And the goal is to keep them pretty insulated so that they can be heated with less, less wattage to maintain a little more efficiency. If, they're, if they have little holes in the high boxes, you have to put more heat into them to keep the tortoises warm. So if you can make them nice and clean, nice joints, everything, so that they don't leak out warm air, it would be a lot of work. Yeah, we just cut it like a, like a doggy door. You know, the bigger tortoises have bigger doors. Like yeah, and I'll get, I use the black pond liner. Um, you can get, you know, it's like a thick rubber, and I'll just hang it and kind of make a couple little slits so they can just see a little bit of light and I'll go right through it and get some bump. We can take a couple questions if you guys want. <laughs> do, they, do they have to hibernate? Um, it depends on the type. They, none of them really have to. Um, there's yeah. benefits to it though, especially if you're breeding. It's, it's kind of part of their cycle. If they hibernate, as soon as they wake up, they're usually pretty eager to breed. Where if they're kept warm through the winter, they won't be quite as easy. Sometimes it still works, but so the babies that are inside, should, should you cool them down so they will hibernate? We actually, if it's a baby that we have that we're keeping, we hibernate them the first year. We last year put a bunch of greens down, and I was pretty nervous about it, but they all came up just fine. And usually around like Halloween time, I'll go dump a bunch of cypress mulch in all the high boxes or like piles of hay and kind of keep it in there. And they'll just kind of do their own thing. They dig down, they go to the bottom of the cypress, they go down. For us, it's three or four more inches below that. And then uh, they just show up again. And we'll then you can see the heat light off so that the temperature is dry. Yeah, the, yeah, the hibernating species don't heat at all. Okay. Any questions? I want to ask about the star portion of talking about how to show this. Um, there's a lot of shells. It doesn't really hurt them. It's kind of a cosmetic thing. A lot of people actually like the look. Uh, being the purest I try to be, I don't. <laughs> but it's, no, it doesn't really hurt them. Um, the ones I raised, this is one I've, I've had about three years, at least kind of like that already at the time. But the ones we're raising, we have a lot of little stars at home that are two and three years old. And right now they look like tennis balls, but they're really smooth. What did you say your height boxes are made Most of the plywood is all I use, nothing but fancy. Yeah, I mean, it's just three quarter inch plywood. Um, a lot of people, we don't really need a heck of a lot of insulation because we don't get all that cold. But if you were, if you had like snow on the ground, you'd want to be a lot thicker, or put some, like a sheet of foam or maybe two you know, wood outside of that. So it's like, and the less ventilation, like the door, you know, the rubber flap helps a lot. If you can begin. Any other questions? I have another hibernation question. Our trail is uh, our tortoise. <laughs> is inside. Um, he ran away once for two months outside, so, so we have better habitat for him outside. Where he's indoors in an aquarium right now with lots of this kind of substrate. And and I've been reading up about hibernation 
Were you able to take food away from them for like three weeks or four um, weeks? Or? The way ours are, if they're outside all year, um, and it's mostly like the Russians and Greeks that are our engineers, the you know, marginalized and urban do too. But they just kind of stop eating on their own seasonally. <coughs> I still offer them food, but they usually, like right now, they're not really eating much. They're pretty much down for the winter at this point in the year. Um, do they, they, I mean, here ours isn't really eating very much. Also. It's a Russian. It's indoors or out? It's indoors, but it has a heat lamp, but our house is cooler. Yeah, so, I mean, a lot of time, even the day length that they see through the windows is going to slow them down. Uh -huh. Should we turn the light still, off and like just. I wouldn't try and hybrid them indoors unless you plan on getting down like to 40 degrees. Okay. If you just, you know, if they're still at like room temperature, they don't truly hibernate because at that temperature they're still digesting food. If they get down in the ground where they're, ours are about 35 to 40 degrees in the winter, and uh, they don't really, they don't really digest food at that temperature. But any warmer than that, you know, if they're above about 50, they would be digesting, they would need to be fed. So keep offering. I would keep them at full heat, just like you would in the summer. And then if you want to hybrid in the next year, maybe just try and get them outside if you can't buy it. It's too cold. Yeah. How cold do you get here? You can get below below zero. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, a lot of people, uh, I know a lot like in Florida, a lot of people put them in the refrigerator to hybrid. Uh -huh. Yeah, actually, which well. <laughs> you just want to keep an eye on temperatures. You know, a lot of times they'll take them out once a month and wait just to make sure they're not losing a lot of weight. If they start getting light, they might want to slowly wake them back up. <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay. Um, water source outside. Um, like I said before, in the summer we do a lot of uh, water bowls and we try and put them where a sprinkler fills them up because it's pretty hard in the summer to keep them full when the sun's hitting them. It helps if they're in the shade. The shade also prevents algae from going in the holes if there's constant water in them. Um, but if you can put them with a dripper or wear a sprinkler, <coughs> it sprays a lot. You should try and stick the bowl right there. Um, a lot of time, our sprinklers will spray up against a wall. We'll put a bowl kind of in that area and then we'll kind of run out and keep the bowl full. And then they learn where the bowl is and they'll go to it when they need to. Um, it's out in the open in the sun. And ours will drive within six hours in Vegas. So it's just, it, it, turns, it turns into a project to keep all the water full. And shade is something that can do a great deal of lower temperatures. If a tortoise is sitting, it can be 80 degrees outside. If it's sitting in the sun, and you go measure the temperature of its shell, it could be well over 100 degrees. And that's just the way the sun, if you picture like a rock in the sun, you pick it up, it's going to be really hot. And tortoises kind of do the same thing. It doesn't really happen when they're indoors. So if, this, if you measure the temperature here, and it's 90 degrees, that's about, the tortoise isn't going to get above that. But outdoors, it's quite a bit different story when the sun is in it. And so you can imagine if it's 100 degrees and it's in the sun, it's going to get really hot. Um, but if you can hang shade cloth, especially, it, it cuts down the temperature a lot. We have an area along our back wall that you can just have shade cloth coming off the wall. And if I'm just back there doing tortoise work, it's so much cooler under the shade. And a lot of you, as you walk into like a nursery in the summer, you notice in the shade areas how much cooler it can be. It also helps keep the plants hydrated better and keeps the grass green. Uh, a lot of stuff just is better underneath. Like a, we use 90% most of the time for shade whatever. You can buy all the different densities of, of shade. <coughs> Next slide. This is a few pictures at the bottom right. You can see one of our eye boxes. That's about eight feet long. So they're big. Um, we've since redone that one outside of the concrete wall. Uh, I don't know Okay, feeding and supplementation. Um, 
things that um, consist like when we feed our tortoises. Um, so they're generally vegetarian, which I love. Um, a big thing like with chameleons and stuff, like <coughs> the crickets, you're doing the mealworms and stuff like that. And it was, for, for us, like to have that many chameleons, it was a lot of work. So tortoises is all vegetarian, um, which, which I really like. Um, let's see, dark naked greens is basically kind of the, kind of like the, the main thing that they eat. Um, you know, red, red leaf romaine, dark leaf romaine, dandelion greens. Um, we do like a lot of spring mix for our babies and stuff just because it's got a nice um, variety. Kale, um, uh, collard greens, anything like that was really good for them. Um, hays and grasses. Um, a lot of our sulcatas, we have a bunch of the big huge ones. Um, we'll just take a bale of hay and, you know, slice off a big old chunk, throw it out there. Um, you know, so we used to wet it. Do we even wet it anymore? To, it kind of introduced new things. Sometimes it's tricky. Like a lot of people will have very tricky, uh, picky tortoises. Um, they've been fed, you know, beautiful romaine lettuce or spring mix or dandelion their whole life. And people are like, I cannot for the life of me get mine to eat grasses or haze. And so sometimes it takes a little bit of, you know, you take the good stuff away. You can't really starve a tortoise. Um, you know, you take the good stuff away and you feed him the other stuff with the hay. When we started first doing it, we put, um, we put the hay out there, we'd wet it down so that it really got the aromas out. Um, we'd, we'd throw in a little bit of lettuce, it mixed in with it, and they just started chowing it. So now we just take the whole bale of hay, throw it out there, and they'll eat the hay. Um, when you have big, huge sulcatas, um, leopards, you know, big things you have to feed that much, um, it helps out a ton if you can get them to eat the less expensive stuff, hay. But that's in their, in their, in the wild, that's what they're eating, so it's great for them. Sometimes it can be very tricky to introduce it to them. Um, <coughs> the Missouri tortoise diet, if you get on websites, um, forums, you'll hear pros and cons of it. You'll hear some people say they absolutely hate it, some people say absolutely love it. I love it. I've known tortoises raised completely 100% on the Missouri tortoise diet. Their shells are beautifully smooth, no pyramiding, um, healthy tortoises, nothing crazy. Because some people think it does have protein in it. Some people think tortoises don't need protein um, and it has too much protein in them. But um, even the sulcatas and leopards, the ones that they say don't need a lot of protein, they eat it and their shells are beautiful. Our shells are beautiful. And so I don't believe that it's bad. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I love it. Most of our tortoises will all eat it. Um, it's what the zoos use to feed. I mean, if, you, if you've seen the Galapagos and Aldabra tortoises, they're you know four feet around, 500 pounds, you know, and they feed them the Missouri tortoise diet. We just shovel it out there for, for our big ones. And I love it. And I think it's a, especially in the winter time when greens are not available, um, I think it's a lifesaver to have. So. I really love it. Um, alfalfa is great for them. Most vegetables, um, zucchini squash. Um, I don't. I didn't put cactus on it today. Cactus is a big one that we use a lot. Uh, prickly pear cactus. We'll just go out for the babies or for the smaller tortoises. We'll kind of slice it as we go. For the sulcatas, we just chop up a little tree, give for them. You know, they'll eat the whole thing. Um, there are a lot of different varieties. Some come with thorns on them. Um, some don't have any thorns. Tortoises will eat it with or without thorns. Usually, to be nice, we'll shave off the thorns. Um, sometimes, you know, we'll just pour it out there and we'll eat it. It's totally fine. They're, they're, they do that in the wild. They'll eat it that way, so it doesn't hurt them at all. But, you know, to be nice, we usually try and, uh, try and shave it down. Um, let's see. Dandelion spring mix. You know, those are, those are really good ones. The spring mix is nice for the babies, just because they're getting a nice variety. Um, uh, the, the more variety you can give your tortoise, the better off they're going to be, because then they'll eat more of things. Um, some seasons you'll have stuff available, some seasons you won't. So, you know, you kind of do it. I think that way you get a nice uh, round diet for them. You know, just feeding them iceberg lettuce, they're not going to get, you know, the nutrition that they need. Um, I mean, granted, tortoises, I don't know, sometimes like leopards especially, you know, all they eat is grass in the wild, you know. So usually that's great for them. They'll eat a ton of it, though. So if you're just feeding them iceberg, I mean, you've got to be feeding them a ton in order for them to get enough nutrition out of that because a lot of that is just plain water. So the more variety that you can feed them, the better. Um, uh, supplements. Calcium is really important, especially with captive bred ones. Um, out in the wild, they eat oh, eggshells sometimes, um, pinky mice, you know, little birds, some of, some of the tropical ones. You know, so they're getting some calcium bones, they'll chew on bones. Um, so captive bred, you want to make sure that you, you give them that, that supplement. Um, Cuddle bone is good. A lot of people use cuddle bone. Uh, you know, they'll just throw out there and the big ones will chew on it. There's a calcium supplement, like a powder that you can sprinkle on their food. Um, we recommend doing it. We do it probably three or four times a week. Um, every other day is pretty safe. 
Um, calcium with D3 is if you're keeping it indoors, it needs to have the D3 in it in order for this type of UVB to process it. Um, uh, I think the natural sunlight can just do regular calcium and process it easily, but I think when you're using the bulb, um, you need the D3 in there, and that's, that's calcium meant for indoor animals. Um, let's see, multivitamins. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there, you know, for, for reptiles to just get a multivitamin. It's just, it's just a smart idea to do. Um, you don't have to do it. We probably do it, well, we do the super veggie, which has the two in one, so we do it three to four times a week. Before we were using the super veggie, um, we, we, were having, we had the calcium separate and the multivitamin separate, and the multivitamin we probably did just a couple times a week. But it's just, it's nice to know that they're just, um, with the super veggie thrown in there, yeah, which brought some, I think, yeah. Um, it's just nice to know, it's kind of, it's just rounds everything out, you know? It's, it's just nice to, to have, we, we know Alan Rapashti who made this, this is just one type of brand. But we know him um, personally, and he's just done so much research and so much of this and that that, that I really I really respect the work he's done, work he's done and I really like his products. Okay, next. Is this super funny, a powder? Like yeah, yeah, it's just like a powder, it's like a dust. And so what we do is we take um, whatever food we've mixed up that day, we'll put it like in a little box, you know, sprinkle it on, shake it around, and then go feed everything. Um, these are just kind of some pictures of the feeding, the grasslands, the leaves, um, drinking out of the water bowl that I threw up there. Next. Oh, sorry, next slide. <laughs> okay, cactus pad is up on the front. For the babies, we always slice it really thin um, in order for them to eat it, because it is kind of, the, the outer shell is kind of tricky or kind of thick. Um, and the babies, like, you know, their little beaks, I'm surprised that they can bite off what they can, but they're adults, you don't have to worry about it. They can bite through a whole apple, whole carrot, easy. But for the babies, we like to slice it kind of thin. Um, spring mix is up on the upper right. The Missouri diet is down on the bottom. For the younger ones, we soak it, it kind of turns a little mushy. Super easy for them to bite into. Our adult cicadas will throw it out there and like eat the whole thing, just crunching it. Um, and then those are stars and uh, spring mix down on the bottom. All right, next. Okay, breeding and hatching. Um, <laughs> I love our pictures. <laughs> um, my backyard is, this is my backyard. All of this is my backyard. And um, maybe if I can bury it. <laughs> it's not going to work, but whatever. Um, so every now and then we'll go out and we get all excited because this, you know, this is what we do. And so we'll go out and you can hear you know, the little noises or whatever. You go search them out and you'll, you'll find, you know, some, some bleeding partners and, I don't know, it's really exciting kind of around our house. But, um, anyway, so these are just some pictures that we took. Um, breeding, in order to get breeding size adults, it takes a long time to grow them if you're growing them from a hatchling. Um, leopards, I mean, they're, they could be a good seven to ten years old before they're either breeding size. Um, so is kind of the same, you know, it kind of more goes by size rather than age, but, um, you know, a good ten, ten inch tortoise is kind of what you're looking for to, to even start. Um, Russians are usually around, I don't know, males about four inches, females have to be quite a bit larger, like kind of around, yeah, like about like this. this she's laid eggs before, so she's a breeding size female. So um, it, it kind of takes a long time if you're raising from hatchlings to build up a collection because it takes years and years and years in order to get breeding size um, tortoises. Um, combat compatibility. Some tortoises, you'll, you'll have a beautiful collection, you'll have a uh, you know, seven to two ratio, whatever, um, and you know, you, you'll know throw in a new one and it throws everything off. So sometimes, I don't know, it just takes time for them to live together. A lot of times, like Russians even, if you're moving them a lot, like indoor, outdoor, we learned this lesson a long time ago, but um, we kind of, yeah, I don't get where he's going, but yeah. Um, you know, uh, they take years in order to establish, like, they, they have to get used to the temperatures, get used to the region, get used to their environment, get used to their partners, and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, it, it can take years in order to get breeding. Should I just let them grow or what? <laughs> um, anyways, you know, so it kind of takes a lot in order to get the breeding. Breeding can be very tricky with, with some of these. So, katas, male, female, done. You know, they're, they're super easy to get to breed. Um, usually have no problem with them. So some of them are tricky, some of them are not. Um, season, a lot of them do different seasons. My husband knows this best. Some of them are laying in the winter, some of them lay in the spring, some of them hatch. I, I, it's all over the place. So it kind of depends on, it's very tortoise specific kind of. Um, stars I know, like our females are very, very heavy right now, so I bet they're, they're in that process right now. They should be laying any time now. 
which is way exciting. Um, you know, sulcatas are usually in spring that they lay, so summer, I mean, we had so many, like you said, the babies popping up out of the ground, the eggs that we incubated and hatching all at once. Like, it was every single day, we just had more and more babies that were, were adding to our collection. It was really exciting. Um, let's see, incubation. Uh, we, that, that's all right. Like, we usually dig them up out of the ground and incubate them. That way we can, the higher the temperature, the more females that were produced. Granted, it's very tricky because the, the higher you go, the more split scoots you can have. Um, which is when the horses come out usually perfectly symmetrical. And if it has like an oddball scoop, it's usually because they um, were incubated too high or too hot. Um, so anyways, uh, and if we usually dig them up, we'll put them in a dish, we measure out the vermiculite, we, it has to be a certain amount of humidity and weight and everything, and then you put them in the closet, we, we use the closet, incubation, whatever you want. Um, we do, it's my linen closet, it's funny. But uh, anyway, so whatever you guys, you know, you kind of just set it up and then uh, we set the temperatures up and they start hatching. It's pretty awesome. All right, next. These are just some more pictures. These are the egg laying that we have. We have some uh, eggs hatching. Those are star tortoises. Um, so kind of that, that upper right picture, she was laying in the middle of the night and it was actually, it was in the winter, right? It was kind of an oddball, the last of the, of the bunch. It was, was it? It was early though, huh? Is that why it was cold? Yeah, it was, it was really weird. She was the very first one, and so we were worried about her, so we put a heat lamp on her. And sure enough, you know, she just laid her whole bunch of eggs. There we go, it started our season. Kind of excited early. Um, so Cotas can lay anywhere from like, I think the highest number we had was 35 eggs. That was pretty exciting. Um, some of them, like the stars, lay two. You know, so it's, it's a kind of all over the place. Okay, next. Okay, now we'll kind of just go through um, different species that a lot of them we brought here, but these are just kind of the main ones. Do you just want to come stand with me and then we'll just kind of, as we go, add our two bits? But um, we'll start off with the Russian tortoises. Russian tortoises are very popular. Um, they're, they're spunky. I love my Russian tortoises. When we walk out there, I mean, they know it's feeding time and all of a sudden out of their high box comes one, two, 20, 30, you know, they're all over and they just kind of rush you. It's really fun. Um, they only get to be about six to eight inches. Um, in size, and they're a dry desert tortoise. They're actually, the care is a lot like a desert tortoise would be. They can handle the cold, probably, you know, I, a lot of times I refer to them as one that can handle the most cold and the most hot, you know, the biggest range of temperature, because they can be really hot and they can be really cold. We've had them fall asleep like on a really cold night. I've had them out in the open on a night that hit 28 degrees, and it doesn't even kill them. They have like an antifreeze blood or something. But um, normally they're down by about this time of year they go into hibernation. And kind of like the desert tortoises do. It's a pretty similar uh, temperature range, similar diet. Just a mini miniature version. You don't get nearly as big. All right, next. I love my sulcatas. Sulcatas is one of those that everyone comes up. They're probably the least expensive tortoise just because they breed easily. They lay lots of eggs. Um, and they're beautiful. They're, they're really fun. Um, I always tell people, these are the ones that get two to three feet big, because a lot of people will come up to us, like we do a lot of expos where we go set up a booth, people will come up with us, to us with the little tortoise that they just bought, I mean a baby, and they're like, okay, you know, what do I need to take care of this? And I'm like, oh, okay. And like, do you know that this tortoise is going to get to be 150 pounds? And they're like, wait, what? So I, that's my biggest thing, is these tortoises, tortoises are meant to roam. They're meant to have space. They're not meant to be kept in the tank their whole life. Um, obviously, you can see this guy's getting restless already and it's nighttime, but they need room to roam. So how does get to be huge? Two to three feet big. I love mine, they're very personal. My kids go out every day. My little Mac rides around on them. They're just so much fun. They're easy to feed, I think. Um, granted, they do eat a lot, but they eat just tons of stuff. We'll take a watermelon and smash it in the yard and they'll eat the whole thing. Uh, pumpkin, uh, you know, just hit the bale of hay, everything like that. So, so cutters are a lot of fun, most popular tortoise, but they get huge. And so I know they're really cute when they're babies, they look like this, but you need to be aware. Um, they grow fast. Our yearlings are four inches, you know, and it's approximately about two inches a year, would you say, kind of that they grow. In five years, you're looking at a you know, good foot big tortoise. Like, you've got to be aware of that. And these ones don't hibernate. They need to be heated outdoors in the winter um, or brought inside, which a lot of people can't do. So this is what we would not recommend buying if you did live in Chicago. You know, where it's insanely cold. I mean, it'd just be really hard to house. Yeah? In the winters here where it gets zero with the sulcata, can you like put them like in a 
a barn type of thing where they can go in and out. And then, I mean, they won't I probably won't go out. In the they snow. probably won't go out. Yeah, but you you definitely can. Like, I mean, you can house them indoors. It's not a problem. But you just need to be aware of the size. But yeah, in, in your winters, like, um, it will get really cold. In ours, they're still kind of active. Like, because we don't get. I mean, we did get down to 18 last year. But in ours, they're still awake. They're still active. So they'll come out, do one pace around. Even even snowed. Was it last year? It snowed, and there were tortoise tracks in it. And they went right back in their house. So they're still awake. They're still active. They will come out and move. Um, but stay inside. When it's when it's as cold as you're getting, it probably will not want to go outside. So would a garage be big enough though to keep them in? For yeah. The winter? Yeah, absolutely. It would just be a mess pretty quick. Sure, but I mean, See, if you're, I don't if you know. stay up on your main. They don't eat as much. Yeah, they do. They eat less in the winter. Yeah. Okay. And did lowest temperature for one of those? Um, to be outdoors before you have like, to say it. in your garage if you're going to heat your garage so that. Um, it's hard to say the temperature. Uh, I mean. If it was like one night they were out in the open, they could get down just about to freezing. And it's not really going to kill them. Okay. Uh, especially if they're dry. If, they, if it was like raining and really cold, it would probably give them like a respiratory infection. Okay. Um, if you were in a garage, you'd probably want the garage. I mean, what you want to do really is heat like an area. Oh, okay. Just heat, you know, like maybe a mat on the bottom and something on top. So they can get in there, get their body temperature up. They'll run around a couple hours, and when they start cooling off, they go back to the hot spot. Okay. It'd be pretty hard to heat the entire garage warm enough. Yeah. But as long as they have a spot that they can actually kind of warm their bodies back up, they usually train themselves, and they're really easy. Like we just do the doghouse kind of style, um, plywood house, and they they go in, they go out, they go in. Like they, they know they get they're pretty smart. Like they get to know where their home is, where the heat is, and so so it, it's definitely doable, very easy. But it is, it is a risk in the winters, um, and in the winters I'll go out about every night at about nine o'clock with a flashlight. Because we'll have probably once a week something fell asleep in the corner out in the open and doesn't, you know, they'll go out, you know, thinking it's warm, they'll go out and fall asleep. And in the wild, they don't, you know, some, especially like the lepers is kind of what we have the problem with. But they don't really understand, you know, in the wild they don't get cold enough to kill them. So they're not that concerned about getting back to a burrow. So I'll go out every night and check just to make sure it's smart to do. And a lot of times, too, we haven't really talked about, but in the hide boxes, a lot of people use like ceramic heaters. I like to use red light bulbs because it's another double check. You go out back real quick, look at all the high boxes, you see red light coming out of each one. Make sure you know, heat's you know on. the heat's working. Mm -hmm. If you have a ceramic that burns out or you know, the water trips the breaker, you, you know, it, it could be off for three days before you realize that it's off. And sometimes, like really, really cold nights, we'll go and put like a brick in front of the door to make sure they don't come out because sometimes they, I mean, you know, they just, I, I guess, get red If we ever go out of town for a weekend, I'll block them in the high box. Don't come out Better policy. safe than sorry, you know? You just put a block in yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, next. Pancake tortoises. I love these tortoises. The look of them, I mean, we had to keep this. I mean, he, they are escape artists. These things can climb. It's amazing. But uh, they're, they're pancakes. I mean, you know, just super, <laughs> super thin. And the babies of these are just, I mean, a quarter inch thick. Like, they're the cutest things. Ever. So I fell in love with these. I love the pattern. I mean, even on their belly, they're beautiful, but they just got such a pretty pattern on them. I love the pancakes. The pancakes, though, are very shy tortoise. They, um, they hide, in, hide in crevices of rocks and like cracks of rocks. So we did this beautiful, um, yeah, yeah, it's right up there, um, with sandstone, you know, and, and grasses all around it so they can climb in or whatever. And you will put a piece of lettuce out. The pancake will come, grab the piece of lettuce, and drag it. I mean, they'll just go backwards, back right back up into their hole and eat it inside. They're very shy tortoise. I love them. I think they're beautiful. Um, so I don't know. I really, I really enjoy them. They are very shy. The very time shy. that you actually see them, you enjoy that much more because it's something you just don't see constantly. Yeah. So it's kind of cool to see them. It's, it's kind of like a chuck wall on the shell. Is what it is. It's really, they just spend a lot of time hiding in the cracks. Really cool to yeah, they have a really easy diet. These things will eat anything. Um, I've never had anything, you know, that some, some tortoises, you give them something, they just won't even touch it. But pancakes, man, they just beeline right for it. They're really, they're really good eaters. They're really, um, really interesting tortoises. For, for the pancakes for the winter, we do bring them in just because they're so thin and their bellies um, are, are thinner than, you know, most. Um, they're soft for the most. We do bring them in for the winter time. And so we do heat them. We don't let them stay outside. What are they from? What are they Tanzania. East Africa. Yeah, someday he'll take me there, I'm sure, right? <laughs> uh, okay, next. Greek tortoises. Okay, Greeks are one that is extremely variable 
There's a lot of different types of Greeks. That's a, I call them golden Jordanians. There's, there's a golden Greek tortoise that are more like a solid yellow. Um, I think they're more from like, like Lebanon. This one's from Jordan, where the ones from Jordan have a little bit more black in the shell, but the Middle Eastern ones are usually a yellow color overall. And then there's some that come from different parts, like in Turkey, there's some from Libya, and all over like North Africa, all over the Middle East, into Europe a little bit. And so there's, there's several kinds, there's probably at least, a lot of people think there's about 12 different kinds of green tortoises. They are kind of the same species, just a different, it's like a different race, basically. We have about five different kinds that we work with. Every time he gets new ones in or is making a new house for one, I'm like, oh great, what do we have here? Because I can never keep him straight, but he can eyeball it and be like, that is this, this, and this. Like, I don't know how he does it, but he knows exactly what came from where and everything. It's pretty impressive. But they're a lot like the Russians with the care. They uh, get a little bit bigger, but not much. They get the high dome shell, real round. Um, they're probably one of my favorite species. They do great in the desert. They, they hibernate in there, which is nice for me. I like that. Um, and I, have, I prefer the more Middle Eastern types. There's some that come from, like Turkey, that are a little darker color overall. Um, they don't get quite as hot. They don't handle the heat as well. I really like the, the Middle Eastern types of things. There are golden greys that are beautiful. They're just really, um, yeah, the bottom right. They just got like a pretty, just beautiful gold. We have some really, really pale ones that hardly have dots on them that are gold like that, and they're really pretty. Um, okay, next. Hermits are the same. As, uh, I like to say they're the same as Greeks. They're not. They're different. But as far as care, almost look goes, and everything, they're very, very similar to Greeks. Um, same size, same diet, same temperatures, kind of everything like that. Um, they look real similar. They're a little more, to me, they're not quite as pretty as the Greeks. A little somewhere between like a Russian and a Greek in the way they look, kind of the way they act too. The Greeks are a little more shy than the Russians, and the Hermits are somewhere in between. Okay, next, elongated. That's this one right here. Um, they are more tropical tortoise. Um, they like that the higher humidity. They eat, like you know the fruits and veggies more. Um, I love them. They all a lot of them will have pink noses. And they're really cute. To me, these ones seem to be a little bit nocturnal. Like they kind of come alive at night, like when we're out there. Um, you know, their their heads are out and bobbing, and during the day they're kind of just tucked away. Um, they have the really pale faces with the black eyes. Um, I really like these ones. These ones are very cute. I care for those pretty much like the red foot. Real tropical, little protein diet, a lot of water. Okay, next. Red foots. These, I have to say, would probably be one of my favorite, just because they're so personable. Um, they'll let you pet their necks. They're easy to feed. They'll eat, eat right out of your hand. Um, I, I really enjoy them, and I think mine are really pretty. Um, this is a cherry-headed red foot. It's kind of like a cousin to the red foot. Um, the red foots do get larger. They will get to be you know, anywhere from 14 to 16 inches. Their shells don't do the marbling like this. Their shells will stay really black and just have the yellow dots on them. Um, you know, they have... Okay, they have like the red feet and stuff like that. So, um, next, <laughs> cherry head, that's what I just showed you. I love my cherry heads also, they're kind of just like the red foots. They are a little bit more pricey just because they're, they haven't been imported for years and years. Um, and, you know, they're, they're just beautiful. So, they are a little bit more pricey. Um, next, we're almost done. Yellow foots. Yellow foots are pretty much kind of like the red foots and cherry heads. They do need a little bit more humidity. These ones like to be um, a little bit more humidity, less heat. Um, but I, I really like the yellow foots, they're very personal too. Like, they'll always have their heads out, bobbing, you know, hanging out with you and stuff like that. <laughs> um, next, stars. Stars, there's a few different types. This is an Indian star from India. There's a, a little bit larger version that comes from Sri Lanka, which is the island right below India. Um, there's also a Burmese star that is super rare. Uh, but their the hair is basically like a leopard, just kind of a miniature version of a leopard. How big are they? The Indians will get the females maybe 10 inches, the males maybe 6 or 7. The Sri Lankans are a little bit bigger. Very popular, but also very, very pricey because these are the ones that lay in two ways. Right. Yeah. Okay, next. Leopards. Leopards are beautiful. This is our big, big, big female that we love. Um, Kind of, they care for the Sokata the same way. They're like a nice dry desert tortoise. They love the dry heat. Um, they have a hard time in Florida. There's people in Florida that have them that just constantly have respiratory problems from the water. So they're a lot better than the desert. They can handle the cold, but they have to be dry. 
as it was. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure, is there any more? We have to print my chip. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so that's kind of just going over tortoises and a little bit of kind of what we do. I mean, it, once you have the everything down, like we're, I mean, that's pretty much it. But if you guys have any questions, I know we have, we're kind of out of time. No, 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 we're we're going way too long. No, 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 thank you very much.
And the, the main thing is you want to make sure you know where your Russian came from, where your Greek came from, because your your Russian's bigger, right? Like you have you're ready. About four inches. Yeah. 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 It's a bigger. Um, so knowing you, know, I mean, knowing where he came from, and then if you get that size, same size, like a Greek, um, there's possibilities that either could be wild caught or one could be captive, one could be wild caught. You know, so if you if you know exactly where they came from, know that they're very healthy. Their temperatures and everything are very similar, so you'd be you'd be you'd be okay keeping them together. But the scary thing is, is putting uh, you know a Greek with a Russian. They both came from different areas. You know, these ones could have certain parasites that they're totally fine with, you know, but these ones are introducing, you know, so mixing them can be very, If you brought like an Asian very parasite dangerous. into a desert tortoise, that tortoise doesn't know how to fight that parasite. Um, so katas, I don't mix with, we wouldn't mix with anything. They get so big, they grow so fast, they would bully anything or outgrow And Sometimes, some tortoises, you'll have one that just grows and grows and grows and one that stays small, you know, and so you want to make sure that a small one is eating and not, like, sometimes they can feel, you know, kind of, I guess, bullied, would you say, <laughs> in a way, just you know? Those, yeah, they just kind of shy away all the time and they grow a lot slower. Than yeah, so you want to watch that when you're keeping, um, uh, you know, different sizes or different species <laughs> and stuff like that together.